Welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast, where we share all kinds of tips, advice, and interview guests on all things innovation and leadership in modern marketing. Each episode is a conversation with inspiring people who make wonderful contributions to our knowledge in these areas and spark curiosity and ideas to pursue. Join me, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and let's get into today's masterclass on this InnovaBuzz podcast. The better thing to, to really aim for is like freedom to make choice with financial resources you have now or any resources you have now. How do you amplify that um, and make the most out of it? And then getting clear, again, going back to, um, you know, definitions of things that you truly value in life because, you know, if, if you're clear about those things, then um, you can actually spend more time and more resources to have more of those things in your life. And then, you know, you don't need to be motivated to achieve your financial goals because <laughs> it's something that you value all the time. So motivation even becomes, um, you know, um, almost irrelevant. <laughs> Hi there, Innovator. It's really great to be back with another episode. I hope you've had an awesome week so far. I trust that you enjoyed my recent conversations with Jane Beddle of Dovetail Resolutions and with Mike Payton of EOS Worldwide. I'm really excited to have on the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest today, Vivian Goh. Vivian is the founder and financial wellness coach at Simple Wealth Coaching. She built financial knowledge and connections in the property, superannuation and financial advice industries over a decade and then realised that financial know-how is only part of a solution, not the whole solution to wealth creation. This led her to leave her financial advising licence and found Simple Wealth Coaching. Her life mission is to help people improve their financial well-being through personalised coaching and unbiased financial guidance. A quick promotional message from our sponsor, InnovaBiz. We help coaches and consultants build professional credibility, engage their target audience and connect with their ideal clients. Now to help you get clarity about who your ideal client is and how you can communicate with them, to build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship, take a look at our Marketing Master Mini Class, which you can access at innovabiz.co forward slash marketing master. It's completely free and accessible without even giving away your email. In our discussion today, Vivian talked to me about some of the limiting beliefs we have about money and how they hinder our wealth growth. She described how asking really good questions can help you uncover what really motivates people. And she explained that we should consider money as a means of exchanging value rather than an entity of itself. Without further ado then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Vivian Go. Hi, I'm your host Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz and I'm really excited to welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast today from Melbourne in Australia, Vivian Go, who's the founder and financial wellness coach at Simple Wealth Coaching. Welcome to the podcast, Vivian. It's a great privilege to have you as my guest. Hi, Hergen, and hi, everyone else. Thanks for having me today. I'm really excited to be here. Corey Wassell, who was our guest on episode 227 of the Innova Buzz podcast, suggested that we have a conversation with you, Vivian. So, big hello to Corey. Hi, Corey. <laughs> <laughs> now, you have, you have a background in finance, like Corey does having yep. worked as a financial advisor and now you've changed direction to provide personalized coaching and education around financial health and well-being. 
And you do that without necessarily recommending financial products directly. It's more about the total picture. So I'm really interested in exploring that change of direction you've made with you and how you help your clients a lot further today. But before we get on to all things finance and financial health and wealth growth, tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get to where you are today and what were some of the big moments in that journey? Yeah, sure, Hergen. Um, well, I guess um, to to talk about my career in finance. I started by um, graduating from university um, in Monash here in Melbourne about 10 years ago. And I had a degree in uh, banking and finance and accounting as well. But what I found was um, I actually knew very little about managing my own money. So I started working in a real estate company, um, learn about the property market, but find that I didn't quite um, enjoy the culture that I was in. Um, and then I moved on to work in a superannuation fund as a consultant. Um, well, at that point, then I bumped into uh, a financial advisor and I was, I didn't know that you know, there's such a career that exists. And when I get to know a little bit more about what a financial advisor does, it sounds like something that I would really enjoy because it was so much more personable. I get to, you know, get to know a client um, really well, what what their life's like and help them with your finances. So um, I basically then um, got my diploma, financial planning, graduate diploma done and got a role as a financial advisor very quickly. Um, and then I started, you know, um, helping a lot of clients with your finances and earning good money myself. But I still find that um, there was something that was missing, you know, apart from the knowledge and strategy point of view, there's still something that was missing. Um, and, uh, and I was then um, working with, you know, in one of the top financial advice firms um, uh, in the last year or so um, with a lot of clients, like doing great works. But what I found was that um, they, they are, uh, I spotted a lot of like unhealthy money beliefs that clients usually have that are actually causing the uh, struggles and challenges. So money beliefs, uh, when they are unhealthy, they are usually the underlying cause of the struggles that, you know, clients are experiencing. So things like, you know, even clients earn a good amount of money, there's still like constant fear of having not enough, not secure, um, or overspending to keep up with the uh, social environment, um, or investing be based on uh, you know, FOMO, like following the crowd, fear of missing out, things like that. Mm. So there were a lot of this um, underlying un unhealthy money beliefs. And uh, I I found that um, the only way to get around it is really have really good coaching conversations with clients to uncover, you know, why are they holding on to those money beliefs? Where did they come from? Um, and... And that's how I ventured into financial wellness coaching. Um, and another thing, like a, a big pivot point was also um, due to reason, uh, you know, changes that's happening with the Royal Commission. So financial advice has become more and more expensive. So due to the compliance cost, um, licensee costs, overhead costs, so everything is getting um, a little bit too expensive for clients don't that don't already have a lot of assets in place. You know, they're just you're, you're starting out. You you want some guidance around your finances, but um, your situation may not be overly complex. Uh, so financial advice might be too big of a jump for you. Mm. And this is something that I've been told by potential clients again and again in meetings where they go, I really love, you know, everything that you do. Um, it sounds great. I'm going to get the coaching and guidance from you. But, um, you know, the, the fees were just too expensive to start. So I basically had a review of how much of the help and changes, like the value that I can provide to my clients, how many percent 
percentage of that is actually coming from telling them, you know, this product or this strategy specifically is the one you need to go for versus my coaching. And I found that most of the transformation that clients were getting, 80% of them were actually coming from uh, more of the coaching component, you know. So Mm. then, um, yeah, I I guess that's what (laughs) entrepreneurship is about really to, you know, listen and be fully present to what's really happening in the market, getting feedback and understanding what's the real problem out there and then offering a solution. So uh, I I founded my own business, Simple Wealth Coaching, uh, July this year. Okay, well that's that's fascinating, and uh, like you say, you know, identifying gaps in the market and what clients are really looking for. But also the other thing you mentioned there along the way was not feeling um, comfortable or happy or fulfilled in in some of the roles that you did pursue, and then you discovered coaching, and really enjoy that by the sound of it. Now. What what specifically is involved in coaching? What do you do with your clients and, you know, why is that important? Yeah. So coaching, coaching is really the um, a, a skill where uh, it's allowing, creating a space for clients to uh, be asked really, really good questions so that they get time to reflect on their you know, their, their common patterns. And if you find that you, if you look at your, your thoughts, um, there has been research done that, you know, um, by the age of 35, 95% of our thought patterns and emotions are the same as the day before. So there's a lot of um, similar thought patterns, especially when it comes to money, when it's such a taboo topic, um, a lot of the money beliefs that we have are actually um, either, you know, taught to us when we're since young by the, and, and a lot of people say by the age of seven, there's been research showing that, you know, your your personality and your your beliefs and your ideas, your perspective about the world has been formed uh, mostly. Um, and then also, they, you, you might have experienced certain traumatized um, events in the past about money that would cause you to create some unhealthy money beliefs. So I'll give you an example um, of a client of mine that uh, she found that she was constantly having this fear of she just doesn't have enough money. And that was causing you know stress in her relationship with um, her partner. And when we got into a coaching session, you know, after 30 minutes, after asking more and more questions and understanding where she's coming from, um, she realized that why she had this fear was because of her previous uh, divorce and relationship. So she went through a divorce and it was a really nasty one. So then she held on to you know, that belief that she needs to protect herself and protect every single penny she has. So she left in, she she was leaving in like a bit of like constant fear of of, uh, not enough. So, and causing stress into her, her relationship as well. So um, that's, that's one way to really shine the light on blind spots that you may not be aware of. And that's causing you, uh, you know, um, certain stress in your life. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. So basically what you're saying is that um, there's there's a whole lot more around what impacts on our attitudes and beliefs around money and and how we come to wealth or not Mm. um, than, than just money or working hard or whatever it might be. Oh, absolutely. Because at the end of the day, money is just a tool. It's, you know, it doesn't have emotions. There's no thoughts. Like if you talk to money, it just, you know, <laughs> it doesn't really <laughs> respond to you or anything. So to to really master money well, um, that means we really need to look inwards and understand and um uh, understand ourselves even better. So money is a great tool to to reflect for us to reflect on um, how we are how we are showing up. Hmm. So what what are some of the common issues and beliefs and attitudes around money that 
have us kind of feel unfulfilled or feel as though we don't have enough money or feel as though we can't spend on certain things that we'd love to spend on. Yeah, so <laughs> there's there's a couple there that you just mentioned. Um, common ones, um, I, I guess I mentioned one of them that is, um, you know, fear fear of not enough. Um, and then there is also this, like, uh, the fear of missing out or buying into the social um, condition of, uh, you know, in, investing a certain way, like buying an investment property is is definitely the way to go. So I have clients that, you know, initially engage me and um, successful coaches, for example, I had this successful coach that uh, came to me earning great income. But um, when it comes to managing his money and planning for his future or making financial decisions, there's still a lot of uncertainty. And all he's heard, you know, from his social environment is that, you know, uh, you just want to, I just want to buy an investment property. But, you know, mm. after we we really got into a deeper conversation in understanding his lifestyle, his values, um, and then set financial goals that are more aligned to his values. Um, yeah, he realized that you know investment property wasn't really what he wanted. So it's it's there's a I think um, one of the things people get confused cons- um, often um, as well is what is a financial goal and what's a financial strategy. Those are two very different things. Because financial goals um, are basically life goals that require funding. You know, you you need money to fund those things. And then a strategy is then you use that strategy to achieve that financial goal. So, but I think um, a lot of people often when they look at money, they start straight away from the strategy. Like I, I want to, um, you know, X amount of portfolio by this amount of time. So, that means that's like uh, basically setting money as the destination, not the vehicle. So we want to make sure that mm. we're using money you know, as a vehicle, as a tool, not as the end goal. Yeah, yeah. So that what you're talking about there would be along the lines of um, I'd like to take a world trip next year and – I'd like to do that on business class, flying business class, and I'd like to stay in four-star hotels. And then I put together a a budget for that and say, well, this is how much money I'm going to need to spend on that, plus a little bit of spending money um, and other stuff I might want to do. And so then the, the goal is the trip and the associated experiences and then you go back to the money side and say, well, here's how much money I'm going to need to be able to do that. And then you build the strategy. Is that how you see it? Yeah. So that is definitely one of the key parts of, um, you know, uh, you know, saving. If if traveling is something that you, you, it's, it's really important to you. But then we go back to, you um, another step so you know why is traveling really important to you so we and and is this goal as well um uh creating any friction with other areas of your life so it's looking at a much more deeper and holistic uh, view of how you're um coming up with this financial goal so mm-hmm. um so that's Basically, we, we look into also your values, you know, your, your deeper values and, um, you know, see that if there's any um, unhealthy money beliefs around that as well. Because if, you know, someone is actually setting those goals and spending on credit card every year without <laughs> um, thinking about the, the consequences, then um, there, there may be more more things to than just setting that goal. Um, so, um, I guess the answer to that is it's hard to uh, really answer that question unless we look at it in a much more holistic way. Mm-hmm. So is that the main difference between a financial wellness coach as compared to an advisor? So I guess you know my experience of advisors are that they will sit down with you and they will look at goals and they will talk about life goals as well. So, you know, are you um, are you looking to buy or sell property? Are you looking mm. to um, 
acquire cars, for example, as a, as a big spend item, are you looking to travel? So they tend to look at the big spend items and then say, okay, let's put together a, a plan going forward. And they certainly will recommend products uh, based on that plan then. So that's the financial advisor. So what are some of the other key differences you've kind of talked about going to a higher purpose rather mm. than just focusing on, say, the trip or the property? Yeah. Um, what are some of the other differences that a financial wellness coach um, provides? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, like you said, there is this um, um, higher purpose or a, a more holistic approach um, towards your finances. Uh, so it's just not about the numbers and strategies or just the product recommendations. Um uh, certainly, there's no commissions involved either as a financial wellness coach as compared to a financial advisor. And usually with, with my process as a financial wellness coach, um, the process really starts with the biggest challenge that the client is experiencing. So in every single uh, meeting that I have with clients, they bring the topic that they are struggling with the most in the context of finance. Um so, for example, um, I, I had uh, two clients uh, that uh, came on board that worked with me just two months ago. Um, you know, initially when they came to me, they really had no clear direction of um, how they should handle their money or they don't really have structure around their future, uh, their finances and their future. Um, so uh, one of the things that we... Um, explored for, uh, I guess I call John and Mary, <laughs> Mary. Um, so uh, Mary, she had this, um, she she had this thing where she feels like um, in terms of her earning capacity, wherever she positions her program, she don't feel as confident um, as she should when she's talking to clients. And uh, this is important and it's a part of financial wellness coaching as well because how you earn money um, and how you feel about it is is a part of your finance because that's how your money is flowing in. So in, in our conversation, we basically get to talk about um, going deeper into why she's feeling that way, not feel, being able to be confident to charge for what she thinks. And we found that there was a pattern where every time she's proposing the price, when it gets to the point to the price, she always thinks that her client don't have money that thought just comes mm. naturally into her head. So it took a while for us to get more and more deeper in, and to find that that was the cause. And once she realized that, and I asked questions like, uh, how do you know? Um, you know, she, 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 she actually said, I, I don't know. So is that thought even relevant then? You know, is that belief even relevant? Should it even be around when you're, um, you know, speaking to clients. And that one thing basically shift her, um, you know, the way that she proposes, you know, her, her coaching programs to, to clients. And it just makes it so much more um, easier for her. Um, and then, yeah, with, with um, so it's like one of the things is like really starting with the real challenges that a person is actually um experiencing and asking really good questions to uncover those unhealthy money beliefs so that there is like more of those aha moments that's going to help you to transform the way you, um, you know, uh, relate with money, think about money and, and manage it. Hmm. Yeah, so that that's a really interesting example there with um, Jane, uh, as you called her. So clearly she's a business owner. And one of the things that I always find I mean, I personally find it challenging, but I find that most business owners find this challenging is setting pricing for products or services. Mm. And I guess underneath that challenge is always that thought as to, will my customer be able to afford it? So you are actually making that assumption, you know, they don't have enough money for this rather than thinking about, you know, what value does this mm. bring? to my yeah. client and and what value does it represent to them um, which is kind of when you think about it money is that isn't it it's 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 something that represents value mm. so if you've got a service um, you know what value does the service represent to the person and so therefore the money equation t comes out yeah, of that that's right so do you have any 
any kind of recommendations there in terms of addressing that mindset in a business owner? Yeah. So I think first of all, um, Hergen, I think you brought a really good point there. Like, um, you know, value, that's important. And I want to just broaden that perspective even a little bit more um, because um, to, to I, I guess to really master money, we first need to go back to actually what was money really, um, uh, how, why does it exist in the really first place? You know, if we want to master money as a tool and charge for our value, well, what is money at the first place? And money really is a, a medium of exchange. Hmm. It's a medium of exchange that was created 6,000 years ago. Um, and it started with um, a form of barley. So people were trading barley instead of doing barter trading. They were counting barleys to pay for goods. And that is basically it. It's a convenient way of exchanging goods, skills. And um, if you if you truly realize that and let that in, then you know that, you know, charging – Charging a price, fixing a price is really, you know, a little bit like a play. So you find out the skills that you're good at, the the more problems you can solve for a person that they value, you know, they'll they'll pay more for it. And and that's it. It's really that simple. Hmm. Okay. So what are some of the other limiting beliefs or um you know, attitudes that you come across quite regularly in people dealing with money things? Yeah. Um, There is also um, some that are, um, for example, uh, this is a common one as well. I have clients sometimes that um, come to me often. I had this client, um, let's call him John. Uh, He came to me uh, again a few months ago and he told me in my first session that, uh, you know, what I want is financial freedom as a goal, as financial freedom. Hmm. So now the, the thing is, you know, with financial freedom, there is no problem with that, but just think for a second, you know, if you want to set a goal as having financial freedom, guess what happens? Well, I mean, my first thought is what what does financial freedom actually mean? You know, freedom of what? Um, yeah. And it's an away from motivation as well. So you're always looking back at what you, um, where you're coming from. So yeah. it's kind of, it's negative energy in, in a way, isn't it? Yeah, right on, uh, Hergen. And, and financial freedom, if you aim that as a goal, um, because it's so vague, and also it's used as a more of a marketing strategy by most of the, you know, financial services, mm. um, you know, financial products, um, it creates a sense of lack straight away. Yeah. You know, if you're aiming for financial freedom in the future, it creates that sense of lack. So, you know, the, the better thing to, to really aim for is like freedom to make choice with financial resources you have now or any resources you have now. How do you amplify that um, and make the most out of it? Mm. And then getting clear, again, going back to, um, you know, definitions of things that you truly value in life because – the, you know, if, if you're clear about those things, then um, you can actually spend more time and more resources to have more of those things in your life. And then, you know, yeah. you don't need to be motivated to achieve your financial goals because <laughs> it's something that you value all the time. So motivation even becomes, um, you know, um, almost irrelevant. Hmm. So do you, when you work with people, Um, let's take that example. So you work on the values level and you work on identifying what the underlying values are and maybe make some tweaks there. Yep. So uh, values is the second part, but the first part is um, most importantly, is the unhealthy money beliefs. So the blind spots. Hmm. Yeah. So blind spots like unhealthy money beliefs are a little bit like um, 
They're a little bit like a pair of glasses, colored glasses. Let's say if you have a blue glasses, you put it on and you completely forgotten that you've put it on and you started to look at the world just in, in blue. It's been filtered, right? Um, so it's it's not until like, you know, um, I go, hey, um, hang on a sec. That Are you wearing, <laughs> why are you wearing that blue glasses? Like, what do you mean? What do you mean? I, I'm not. Everything is fine. I can see well. And so, no, you're wearing this blue glass. And they take it out. It's like, oh, actually, I don't need this. Oh, this is much more <laughs> easier now. So um, uncovering blind spots is, is a little bit like that. So the the main work is, um, I think the, the key difference is in my coaching is to, to get that part first, that component. Um, and it usually uh, starts from, you know, the... Um, the, the places where people find most tension or challenge in. Um, and I guess a, another example that I would give is like um, uh, uh, just a few weeks ago, I had a client that uh, had a first session and, you know, we were, she was explaining her, her financial situation and I found the pattern of her looking into the future and she's constantly stressed and that means she's doing one thing really well if you're stressed about your finances you're constantly looking into the future and looking at what's wrong what's going to go mm. wrong right and the more you do that the more energy it consumes um, and takes you away from you know, making the right financial decisions now and so that you can really progress and change your situation. And when I point that out to her the first time, uh, then the second time, the second time it really landed for her. Um, yeah, she, 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 she stopped. She stopped. <laughs> She stopped making up problems um, and started to shift her perspective and really um, looking at things more objectively. You know, she's she's mm. now being more aware. Now it's about bringing that into awareness for her, and then um, we get to start working on other different things that are you know more important. That's going to really help transform her financial situation. Yeah. Yeah, I like. I mean, I like the way that you kind of bring everything together and aligning values and beliefs and lifestyle goals around money. And to me, it's a little bit like, um, you know, the financial wellness aspect is a little bit like your health wellness. I mean, mm. we all um, these days mm. we're all talking a lot about physical health, and we look at. Um, you know, doing exercise, being fit, eating well, regular visits to a GP to have all the appropriate health tests done. Um, and, you know, the um, in the financial area, I see that, you know, that there's a bit of a metaphor there as well. That There is, of course, the triage bit where, you know, if we have a serious health issue, then that's got to be dealt with straight away. Mm. And that might be the same in financial situation if we suddenly have a lot of debt or go bankrupt in the worst <laughs> scenario then clearly there's something that needs to be done um, in a triage sense but then a longer term thing about addressing yeah. beliefs attitudes and and then building strategies to match the lifestyle is is i think yeah. a really good way to approach it yeah absolutely and that's the thing about life isn't it hergen like um if you know, if uh, you start to experience some, you know, like your body, you know, it starts to give you signal before it gets to a really serious, like, crisis. It always mm. gives you a little bit of signal here and there. Um, you know, if you're not sleeping well, if you're not eating well, you haven't walked or exercised or, you know, do things to uh, clear your mind even for your mental well-being, like, if you continue to ignore it and it's really causing you stress, what happens is it accumulates and it comes <laughs> in like one big, big hit. So, um, and I think this is just so important. Like uh, fin financial well-being uh, is so important because for for anyone, and especially if you're running a business, if a lot of times so much energy is poured into um, the business, but you know the the. If, if we aren't able to 
manage our personal financial well-being well, it's really hard to then、um, manage your business really well too. And and if you do actually manage your personal financial wellness、um, well, then it actually flows into other areas of your life. Hmm. And I, one of the examples you gave earlier, I, I think you talked about a couple as well. And I know, you know, both from personal and from other experience that I've seen. I mean, in the extreme case, you mentioned divorce there in one example.、Mm. Um, relationships,、uh, money issues inside a relationship can have some pretty dramatic consequences、yeah. if、um, the. Two people are not in the same page, right? Yeah. And if there's different beliefs and attitudes to money, that often ends up they're not on the same page. Yeah, yeah, absolutely.、Uh, couples are,、um, you know, it's it's really interesting space. Couples, I coach a lot of couples, and like you said,、um, often when、uh, couples come together.、Um, Often it's like the yin and yang. You know, one person has a, a different perspective, or maybe more organized, and the other person is much more laid back and、um, easygoing. So, how do you actually come together、um, to then actually manage your finance as well?、Um, so, in in the in the couples coaching、uh, context, then it's、uh, firstly work on yourself individually. <laughs> So they are.、Mm. They are. Instead of you know, we start the process by saying this way is better, that way or better. It's it's not. There's no best way. You know, is is just different ways. So, but when one one couple or one person, any person, even if you're not in a couple, if you're too fixated on doing certain things one way,、um, in all areas of your life, you find that、uh, it will create tension for you. So,、uh, just an example before I gave you, like、um, uh, one of my client that、uh, she she looks in the future and constantly looks for things that were going wrong, and <laughs> that created a lot of stress、mm-hmm. for her. But actually, that is a really really important skill for people that are good at spotting problems. You know,、yeah. in in businesses, if you want to hire a risk manager, you want someone like that. You know, they'll be able to look、mm, into the future、right. and be able to see all the potential risk and go, okay, this is the less riskier route,、um, or this is major issue. We need to fix it now. So that's an important skill. But if you hold that for every single you know aspect of your life, you find very quickly you get into a really stressful mode.、Um, Yeah, so,、uh, so, so it's if for couples is to individually work on things、um, that you may be struggling with, and then coming together to find common grounds. Hmm. Yeah, that's um, that's a、uh, definitely a challenging area, and I guess if you look at、um, business, there's a lot of businesses that are partnerships, so、yes. the same would apply to the business, and also. Yeah, you know, there might be businesses which are,、um, have a larger board that makes a consensus decision. So you find the same thing there, right? Correct. Yeah, and often you find like CEOs would have, you know, broad vision, and they are、um, so much more future and goal orientated, looking at bigger picture. Um, and then, like the you, you get on the side, maybe the CFO is someone that is much more into the the detail, the financials,、um, and then you have that risk manager that is, you know, looking at, you know, the like what I said before, all the things that could go wrong. So、mm-hmm. everyone has quite different views,、um, and and so yeah, how. Uh, in each person individually, will need to you know have that capacity to be flexible in your perspective, way more holistic, so that、um, they don't have to have one set way of doing things, but、um, able to incorporate everyone else.、Hmm. So again, then it comes back to kind of the core、um, beliefs, but. At a higher level, because certainly in a business sense, there there might be a business purpose and a mission、Correct. that、mm. um, the business is on about. So you, you focus 
kind of on that first and as you say bring that flexibility in terms of what actions could be taken and how to how to then create value that allows us to fulfill that vision yeah yeah that's right hergen <laughs> hmm. all right well this is fascinating vivian I, I could dig into this a lot more particularly the mindset stuff i find fascinating and you know the idea that um, i mean if we think back um money the the bits of paper and the coins that we've had you said 6000 years but i think mm. you know even even more recently than that people were trading gold and precious metals rather than actual money so that it's yeah. really just an item of value and the, the bits of paper that have a number written on it is just something that uh, designates a, a particular value doesn't it so the mindset around giving that much more importance is is a little bit self-defeating isn't it in terms of getting more of that value <laughs> yeah i know because now it's like more of the value it's not even a thing now it's a number on <laughs> <Yeah>. the screen <laughs> that's right yeah we just touch our phone on a device yeah and with yeah. bitcoin it's, it's going to be even different again yes yes um, hmm. That's the beauty about human um, evolution and um, our inventions. It's going to be, you know, more and more subtle. <laughs> hmm. All right. So I think this is a good time to move on to the buzz, which is our innovation round, and it's designed to help yeah. our audience who are primarily innovators and leaders in their field with some tips from your experience. So I've got five questions, and hopefully you'll give us some really insightful answers that will inspire the listener to go and do something awesome today yeah definitely let's do that so what's the number one thing you think anyone needs to do to be more innovative yeah i think the number one thing it's really if there is any stress you're experiencing in your life is to get that out of the way um, as soon as possible find ways to resolve it straight away because if you're experiencing any tension stress um, in your relationship finances or um, you know any other areas of your life it really sucks up your energy um, to allow you to be innovative so mm. get those problems out of the way first like you know go with what you find the most challenging um, at the moment and go straight on yeah yeah and uh, i i'm guessing that you'd recommend dealing with the root cause of the stress rather than correct some, uh, just easing some symptoms for a while yeah yeah it's hmm. so important getting to the root cause because once you get to the root cause um you know it's it's something that you don't have to constantly patch up again and again Mm. Or you don't have to keep motivating yourself to be innovative for, you know, yeah. whatever that is. Uh, it, it starts to become so much more uh, natural. All right. Great. Well, what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? Yeah. Uh, for me, one of the most, um, you know, the best thing I've ever done um, was my is my daily routine in meditating. So from that space of stillness and silence that's why i i'm able to really listen and look for patterns that's happening in the market or um in my coaching conversations with clients mm -hmm. so how long have you been doing that routine for uh for five years okay hmm. yeah. interesting all right now what's a, a favorite resource you have that you use most often um, this one is an interesting question, Hogan. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll have to say, like, you know, my my favorite tool is still, or system, I would still say that it's, you know, my capacity to to really look for, for patterns and then, you know, kind of see what's really going on um, in, in the market and then, allow allow the creativity and innovation whatever you know whatever needs to come up as an answer to to kind of reveal itself because i don't really have to think a lot it's 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 being innovative is about 
being in tune with what's going on and then creating something that is, you know, valuable. So, um, yeah, I would say still the ability to be able to look for patterns. Mm. Okay, that's fascinating. Did you, um, is that something you've cultivated and, and taught yourself over time or is just something that's come naturally for you? Yeah, um, both actually. <laughs> <laughs> as, as I cultivate <laughs> and spend more time, I guess, um, you know, um, learning to listen or listen really well or look at things in in um in a more holistic way yeah patterns start to to reveal so the more i do it the better i get at it as well so then it starts to look like it's natural (laughs) (laughs) so listening and asking good questions is very important then you mentioned asking good questions earlier yeah absolutely all right well now what's the best way to keep a client on track Yep. So the best thing to do to keep a client on track, I think I would have mentioned this before, but um, I, I, I think I couldn't mention enough because it's really important. It's, um, mm. I would say, great um, questions and coaching conversations to uncover uh, what they really truly and truly want, you know, um, getting giving them more aha moments um, and realization and that's going to help them to stay on track because, you know, the, the, the plan or the, what we about to do, the action plan and all that, it's actually all coming from them. I'm drawing all this answer for them. So um, they don't need to feel motivated to do it. It's, it's something that Mm. they truly want. So there's more energy and momentum um, in the process. Yeah, yeah, that's great advice, isn't it? If you can get the client to build their own plan forward, then the motivation is very strong. Mm, that's right. So, so it's yeah, it's not so much of me giving advice or um, just mentoring them or anything like that. It's yeah, they come up with their own answers. Mm. All right, great. Now, what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? Yeah. <laughs> Great question. I, I think firstly, it's to really, really um, look inwards, you know, into yourself first and get to learn more about yourself and what your strengths are and what comes naturally to you, what you enjoy. Because um, to to differentiate yourself just, you know, as a once-off thing, it's easy. You just need to create a lot of noise and... and <laughs> You know, but if you want to differentiate yourself in a way that's going to be sustainable um, in the long run and, you know, be a leader in, in whatever you're doing in the market, it's to really look inwards and know yourself well. Hmm. Yeah, that's great advice. So, I mean, there is a lot of noise out there, so I think the one-off noise-making <laughs> strategy probably isn't all that effective. But the, you know, ha- having a really clear knowledge of yourself your strengths your shortcomings as well Mm. and and particularly you mentioned something there that i think is really important as part of that as well as what what you really enjoy doing and if you combine all those things and give it your unique flavor that that will really differentiate you yeah well said (laughs) hergen all right well thanks vivian this has been really great now where can people find out more about you and maybe even reach out and get in touch yeah, definitely. So if you want to get in touch, or if you want to work one-on-one with me, you can either connect with me on Insta, uh, that's Simple Wealth Coaching. So on Instagram, Simple Wealth Coaching, you can go to my website, simplewealthcoaching.com.au, um, or you can connect with me on LinkedIn um, for my, with my personal profile, Vivian Go. All right, that's great. And we'll have links to all of those in the show notes so that people can just click straight through. So yeah. what, what's the, what's on the horizon for your future? What are you working on right now? Yeah. Um, so because uh, at the moment with my business, it's um, a lot of uh, one-on-one coaching or couples coaching. Um, I'm also 
uh, doing a lot of financial well-being workshops. And I think in the future, um, what I'm planning to do is to also offer financial wellness programs to businesses so that they can, you know, bring me in and do group coaching sessions um, to improve their employees' financial well-being. So that is something that I'm working on in, in the future. Um, and I think like, you know, I, I just imagine like if if you're an employer, if you can, you know, tell your new employee, you know, if you join our company, one of the things that we would ensure uh, will help you with is to make sure that you're financially, um, you know, stable or financially well. We look after your financial mm. well-being. So um, that way you don't really have to worry too much if you – anything unexpected happens, you already have a plan in place to deal with all those things. So um, I think that would be such a great promise to employers to give to employees. Um, you know, if, if they you, you genuinely care about the well-being of your employees, uh, that would be a good program to have. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. again, it comes back to what we were saying earlier about comparing it to a health wellness program. I mean, a lot of companies now are doing that in the the health area and physical health and well-being area so to add a financial wellness program to that as well would be very good oh that would be really really good and important too because um I, I, one of the things I think I haven't shared uh, Hergen was um there's been research by the Australian psychological society um, around stress and well-being uh, of Australians, and it's showing that 49% of people that they survey experience stress around your finances, mm. and it's the number one cause of stress mm. in Australia. And in America, they did something similar. Um, so if there's any uh, American audience here, um, it's closer to 80% in America. Wow. So it's a... Yeah. It's a, yeah, it's a, it's, I think it's a space where it's such a taboo topic. Like people, no, we, we don't really know how to deal with the money conversation with employees, but it's, it is really, really important um, to, to, you know, start to put some action plan in place to support employees a little bit better. Hmm. All right. Well, that's terrific. So we'll, Watch out for that and see how you go with that. Look forward to um, hearing some more. So what's the number one parting bit of advice you'd like to give our listener, so particularly a business owner that wants to be a leader in their field and a leader in innovation? Yep. So to to be a, a leader, um, what's What's important about a leader is the being able to continuously lead, leading. So it's like a, a continuous um, movement. You continuously lead in the industry, and that means it needs to be sustainable. And I think I point to what's uh, this point before is you know being able to look at things, um, look into the market, look into what's really truly going on in the society? What's the real problem that requires solving and solve that? And if you can do that continuously, then you become um, a leader in in the field that you're in. Hmm. Yeah, that's great. I like the idea, look for problems that require solving and solve them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's what people will pay you for. Lots of value in that, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, finally then, Vivian, who would you like me to chat with on a future Nova Bus podcast and why? Yeah, um, there's so many, but um, I think uh, I would recommend uh, Christina Cantors from uh, Australian Podcast Services. Um, she's a, a communications coach and I think – there is a lot that the audience can actually learn from her in terms of uh, being able to communicate effectively. Okay, well, we'll get an introduction from you to Christina and we look forward to chatting with her too because she sounds fascinating. Yeah, yeah, she is. I'm, I'm sure you guys will enjoy it. <laughs> 
All right. Well, thanks so much for sharing your time and insights with us so generously today, Vivian. I've really enjoyed this. So there's been a lot we've touched on in terms of money and mindset and beliefs around money and how really it's just a kind of a means for exchanging value. And if we bring it back to that, then a lot of limiting beliefs that we might have, um, maybe we'll find it easier to drop those and have better beliefs. So thanks again yeah. for sharing all that with us. Um, and I wish Welcome. you all the best for the future. And let's keep in touch. Yeah, let's do that again. Thank you so much. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed that insightful and informative conversation with Vivian and took something away from her episode. I love the idea of financial wellness as a concept, just like health wellness. And, of course, that financial wellness takes the focus from money to what your life goals are and how you can support them financially. I'd love to know what you took away from Vivian's episode. Leave a comment below the blog post, which you can find at innovabiz.co forward slash Vivian Go. That is V I V. I-A-N-G-O-H, all lowercase, all one word, innovabiz.co forward slash Vivian Go. You'll also find contact information for getting in touch with Vivian there, as well as links to the Simple Wealth Coaching website, her social media pages, and the other resources we spoke about in today's conversation. Vivian suggested that we have a conversation with Christina Cantors of Podcast Services Australia on a future Innova Buzz podcast. So, Christina, keep an eye on your inbox for an invitation from us to the Innova Buzz podcast, courtesy of Vivian Go. Remember to check out our Marketing Master mini class at innovabiz.co forward slash marketing master. It's completely free and accessible without even giving away your email. But most importantly, in less than 30 minutes, you'll gain absolute clarity about who your ideal client is and how you can communicate with them to build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship. And if you'd like our help to go even deeper into marketing mastery, or if you'd like our help with setting up your own podcast or producing a podcast, then send me an email to jurgen at innovabiz.co and we'll set up a quick call just to have a conversation and find out if we're a good fit for one another. Tune in again next week to the Innova Buzz podcast. We've got some more fantastic guests lined up, including Sarah Anderson of Visibility Co. and Steve Sims, the author of Blue Fishing. Stay connected with us by subscribing to the Innova Buzz podcast at innovabuzz.com forward slash subscribe, I-N-N-O-V-A-B-U-Z-Z dot com forward slash subscribe. Make sure you never miss another episode. It would also mean a lot to me if you leave us a review because what you think matters. I'd love to hear your thoughts, your ideas, your suggestions or questions you have, so go ahead and share them in the comments below the blog post for this episode. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember, be awesome and keep innovating. Innovabiz.co